Hello, and welcome to A Critical Dragon, where I talk about narrative in film, television, and in books. And this is going to be a video, just some thoughts about a particular type of narrative structure and movement, and how thinking about how the tensions within a narrative can actually be quite revealing of the text that you're actually reading. And the the one that I kind of want to look at here, and it's a, it's a really good, simple, straightforward example of this, is urban fantasy. But urban fantasy, the difference between a book one and the difference with the same series, but much later on in the series. And how, even though as a reader, when we are reading, we're reading about the same characters, we're reading about their continuing adventures, but actually the structure of the story changes, the structure of the narrative changes. And we may not be fully cognizant of it until we kind of take a step back and look at how this structure, uh, narrative structure stuff is actually happening. So, for instance, um, Jim Butcher's Dresden Files, uh, Kevin Hearn's Iron Druid Chronicles, and even uh, like Charlene Harris's Southern Vampire Mysteries, the, the Sookie Stackhouse books. Um, they operate as fantasy series and they are urban fantasy of a greater or lesser extent, depending on how you're sort of defining it. And one of the critical approaches that we talk about uh, in terms of fantasy analysis, and this was Farrah Mendelssohn came up with this in Rhetorics of Fantasy. And well, it's based on other theories as well, but it, she put together Rhetorics of Fantasy. But she talks about intrusion fantasy. Um, Whereas another type of fantasy that she kind of isolates in that book is a immersive fantasy or immersion fantasy. So what we are dealing with is as a series develops, or at least I'm arguing that as a series develops, urban fantasy series tend to start in sort of book one or book two, they fall under this idea of an intrusion fantasy. I'll go into that in a second. But by the time you've gotten to book five, book seven, book 10, you've actually moved into a different type of fantasy, even though it's the same setting, the same characters, uh, the same author, the same world, everything is the same, but the type of story being told has actually changed. So if we think of early installments in urban fantasy, they usually feature an intrusion of fantastic elements into a relatively mimetic uh, diegetic setting or, or story world. And these intrusions lead the protagonist into engaging with these elements of the fantastic that have intruded and resolving the problems created by the intrusion. So um, Harry Dresden defeating an evil wizard or Atticus fighting off the fairy or Suki stealing with the ramifications and repercussions of vampire Bill moving into the neighborhood. But later installments in the series move further away from that particular structure. And they move more toward an accepting or immersive stance toward the fantastic with a more active exploration of the fantasy elements. So Dresden in the later books routinely leaves uh, Chicago to frequent more exotic locales and other planes of existence. Um, Atticus sort of abandons Arizona in favor of visiting McKiernan Oog and Asgard, and Suki spends less time in the domestic settings of Bon Temp and begins to engage with the, the complicated politics and social structures of this broader supernatural world. But in each, in each case, the, the baseline diegetic reality becomes more fantastical um, and less mimetic. It gets further and further away from the baseline starting world, which was very similar to ours, to become something much less similar to ours. And as a series, an urban fantasy series progresses, typically a greater number of the characters and a gr greater proportion of the dramatis personae are magical or fantastical in nature. Quite often in a, an urban fantasy series, the majority of characters are normal. 
But if you think 10 books into a series, the majority of the characters you're now involved with tend to be more fantastical or supernatural or, or strange. So framing this in uh, structural terms or narratological terms, rather than narrative tension being created through confrontation between a hero and an intrusive um, fantastical element, the narratives derive tension and impetus from the interaction with an exploration of the wider supernatural and magical realms. The, the hero, the protagonist, is no longer preoccupied with the defense of the mimetic reality from a magical intrusion, but rather the protagonist is engaged with a broader reality. And it's just that that reality in question is fantastic now rather than mimetic. But if these series transition from, as like I'm arguing here, as these series transition from intrusion fantasy to immersion fantasy whilst reading, how are they remaining true to the series with no apparent or significant alteration of plot, story, character, or type? What, what does the identification of intrusion or immersion really highlight and illustrate? But I suppose a nicer way of sort of framing this is if fantasy series are a continuation of an existing narrative, how can we explain the transition from one narrative structure to a different narrative structure? Like what is actually happening? And a standard sort of structural approach to analyzing narrative is to locate that driving force of the narrative, the narrative tension. And this can usually be found as existing between two opposing forces the protagonist goals or desires acting in one direction and driving the narrative towards that and a counter force that exists acting in the other direction. So the antagonist goals or desires, which sometimes is about putting obstacles in the hero's path or creating a problem that the hero has to exert. But essentially we have protagonists going in one direction, antagonists going in the other direction. And the narrative tension is the thing that's created between the two. So if you think Lord of the Rings, the heroes want to destroy the ring. Sauron wants to reclaim the ring. They're acting in two different directions. Sherlock Holmes, the detective wants to solve the murder. The serial killer wants to go on killing. Um, if we think, you know, Thanos wants to destroy half the life in the universe, the Avengers want to stop Thanos from destroying half the life in the universe. It's it's a very simple, straightforward, I suppose we could even go slightly reductive way to think about narrative tension, but it helps us boil down into trying to find how stories work. And there are different ways that you can approach this, like Vladimir Prop in the morphology of the folktale, again, did that chopped away and pared away a lot of the individual aspects of folktale and, and folk narrative to try and find these underlying structures about how the narratives were functioning. Um, Joseph Campbell in the monomyth did the same thing, chopped away all of the distinct um, cultural flavor and identity of stories to try to find underlying structures. And I'm not defending either one of those approaches as a way to appreciate um, individual folklore and folktale and the cultures that you know, created them. What I'm talking about are these structural elements that when we think of how stories function and different ways of understanding story and how it functions, once we understand how these mechanisms work, then we can appreciate it in situ in, in all of its glory when we look at individual narratives. But there, there was an, a guy called John Clout who wrote, uh, the, who compiled the Encyclopedia of Fantasy. And instead of looking at um, what Prop did, uh, because Prop was uh, sort of simplistically put, Prop was looking at a lack or a wrongness in the world that initiates a call to adventure and the hero journeys and passes trials before redressing this lack. And the narrative then sort of concludes with restoration and healing of the world order. And if you think Campbell did a similar sort of thing, that the, the diegetic story world has been disrupted 
the hero rises to counteract the disruption and the resolution of the adventure is when this disequilibrium, this out of balance has been negated and the world order re-established. Clute in the Encyclopedia of Fantasy um, actually had a, a concept called the full fantasy, which again uh, hints at this. There's a sense of wrongness with the land. There's a problem which once the hero has successfully completed their journey, this wrongness has been corrected, the land is healed and restored. So you can see, now, again, this is pairing away, even with these different structural approaches, some of the nuance of them. But the general sort of idea is there's a problem created, the hero goes on an adventure, solves the problem, the status quo is um, returned. And that's your you know, your narrative arc. So if we think then in terms of Mendelssohn's intrusion fantasy, again, the trajectory of, of an intrusion fantasy sort of fits with this. You have your mimetic reality, a fantastical element intrudes into this reality, it dis disrupts normality, and it has to be negotiated with, defeated, or, or pushed out, or controlled. Something has to be done with this intrusion to negate it. And if you think of all of these different approaches in their most general terms, they're all highlighting much the same thing. So specifically about urban fantasy, we have a mimetic reality, one that's very similar to our world, that's placed into disequilibrium or wrongness or lack by the intrusion of a fantastic element which shouldn't be there. So in effect, the mundane world has been disrupted by a fantastic intrusion. The protagonist then seeks to remove or resolve this either by, you know, defeating the intrusion if it's a person or um, sending back the strange alien thing to somewhere else. Uh, but trying to, uh, trying to return the world to a sense of normalcy and mundanity. Um, and that all seems relatively straightforward. But if we if we think then, just to, to illustrate it, uh, The Dresden Files, uh, book one, Stormfront. So in the case of Stormfront, you have modern, well, we say modern day Chicago, slightly older version of Chicago now, but modern day Chicago is basically under magical attack. The police are outmatched. They don't understand what's going on. This is outside of their realm of experience. They don't understand the supernatural. They don't understand how these things are happening. And so they call in basically Harry. Um, Harry Dresden acts as a private investigator, but is listed as a wizard. And he eventually, a series of elements over the course of the novel, tracks down the evil magic user and defeats them. Thus saves the city, protects the mundanes, the, the normal people from this fantastical intrusion, protects them from knowledge of the supernatural world, returns to his apartment to await the next adventure, the next case. So the world has returned to its status quo and we've followed him along the way. So the majority of the narrative focuses on Harry's efforts to track a supernatural killer on the streets of, of contemporary Chicago, whilst hiding information about the fantastical world from the police. So Harry is acting as a supernatural guardian protecting the mundanes from a fantastical world that they're not ready to nor capable of accepting. Um, and this narrative tension then that I was talking about is created through Harry's drive to protect the innocent civilians of the city, solve the case, prevent himself from being killed in the process, all because there's this intrusion of an evil fantastical element that doesn't belong in the city, that is creating all of these problems. And so he needs to stop them. He needs to bring the villain to justice. In a sense, the fantastic intrusion disrupts the mundane reality. The hero seeks to correct this wrong. Once the intrusion is contained, normality resumes and the narrative resets ready for the next adventure. Typical intrusion narrative. And, you know, that holds true for, for Clute, for Campbell, for Prop, and for Mendelssohn, they all kind of agree that's the story structure of, an, of this kind of, of story. Let's have a look at uh, the Iron Druid 
uh, Iron Druid Chronicles by Kevin Hearn, and book one is Hounded. So Atticus, 2,000-year-old uh, Irish Druid living in Arizona, because, uh, yeah, we wouldn't burn there. But essentially, some fairy characters arrive, having tracked them down, and they cause havoc, and Atticus tries to counter them to protect the locals from being exposed to these supernatural elements and being killed by them. And so ultimately, in order to return the world to normal, Atticus has to defeat the fairy. The arrival of an unwanted fantastical element, the fairy, creates this narrative tension in the book. The fantastic intrusion creates a disequilibrium within the mundane or um, mimetic reality and it has to be thwarted by the hero to resolve the problem and return the world to normalcy to heal the world so in the case of book ones or well, books one in the case of books one like courts marshal um all of those different approaches about intrusion fantasy seem to hold pretty true like they are um, quite accurately describing what is happening in the text. Now, admittedly, again, it's about the structure. It's not about the individual aspects. But um, whether it's we discuss it in terms of a wrongness or a lack or an intrusion, that's the thing that is being resolved. The hero progresses through trials and adventures. Sometimes we call these the narrative kernels, narrative satellites, before ultimately repelling the intrusion and righting the wrong the world gets returned to normal. But what happens later in the series? Because anyone reading the series, any of these series is going, yeah, but this is just a continuation of the same story. So while they begin, each of these series seems to begin very much as an intrusion fantasy with mundane mimetic realities, which have been invaded by fantastical elements, the later books have embraced a fantastical reality. And there's a more active exploration in the narrative of this magical or supernatural potential within the story world. So the fantastic essentially becomes normalized. It becomes the normal setting. So magical and supernatural, whereas before that was strange and intruding into the diegesis, into the diegetic reality. Now the supernatural or the magical is the normal reality. And therefore, it's just an exploration of this. That narrative tension is, is completely different. So if you think in Changes, book 12 of the Dresden Files, this is actually a radical shift um, and demonstrates a radical shift within the series because Harry's points of connection to Chicago, his, his car, his apartment, his office, they're all gone. His daughter, who we didn't really know anything about, has been kidnapped by vampires. And even with the resolution of this narrative, Harry can't really be a father to her. And therefore, he embraces living more in the magical world and not living in the mundane Chicago anymore. Um, so the, the narrative culminates in a journey with his fairy godmother, his magical apprentice, his um, half-brother who's a, a, a vampire, a magical dog, two half-vampire vampire hunters, another group of wizards, and a bunch of sort of Norse mythological mercenaries. And they, they traipse all over um, is it the Chichen Itza and the Never Never, and they battle vampires and the familiars and the servants and vampire masters. And there's a big full blown epic battle in an exotic location. And there's only the most passing, tiny resemblance to the real world. And this, this story is populated by magical and fantastical creatures. This is not about Chicago anymore. It's not about the people of Chicago. It's not about the mundanes and Harry protecting them. This is an entire magical story. So many of the, the major aspects on, of that novel focus on like exploring the politics of the, the supernatural realms, such as like the vampire courts and the council of wizards and the fairy courts and the holy knights of the church. 
And very few of these aspects are directly explained to the reader. Like there's an assumption within a series that if you're on book 12, you'll already be familiar with uh, each of the concepts being explored. This is just greater depth. The tone and style are clearly immersive because we are the, the author is assuming the knowledge that the reader has and isn't explaining it. This is now exploration, not setting up the world building. And there's a shifting of the tension from uh, basically a passive reactive um, counteraction in response to an intrusion, uh, intrusive element to a more active journey and a quest adventure to battle the fantastic elements in a magical locale. So this is more of a quest to find and rescue Harry's daughter, not to stop the intrusion of red court vampires into Chicago. The destruction of the red court vampires does not reset the world ready for the next adventure. So this, this isn't the same as book one. This is very different to book one. Structurally, it's different. The focus is different. How it's being explored is different. But how did this occur? So if we think about it in terms of the, the setting, the mimetic setting, be it Chicago um, or somewhere in, in Arizona, establishes a baseline diegetic universe or story world for the reader. And it suggests a diegetic reality that is easily understood and easily negotiated given its cultural verisimilitude and its implied rules. It's easier to understand uh, reality about which the reader can make a series of assumptions and educated guesses. Gravity is going to function. Police and fire trucks will respond to emergencies. Characters will have to pay taxes. In effect, it eases the reader into a state of assumed security and comfort which can then be intruded upon by a fantastical element to unsettle, entertain, or entrance the reader, depending on the author's intention. But by establishing this base mundane norm, any fantastical element will be more fantastical by contrast. And it'll also create certain expectations about how the fantasy elements will be explained within the setting. There must be a rationalization of the fantasy. So, for instance, if dragons exist and are flying around, why have they never been seen? Which, you know, is one of the issues with the Harry Potter universe. You have to create a reason for why, if these things exist, why does the mundane world not know about them? If vampires exist, why have they never been caught? And so on and so forth. There must be a reason to explain their existence in our reality, the mimetic base for the novels. The author has to find various ways and means to allow the reader's perception of the reality to coincide with that diegetic reality created, but make the inclusion of potential fantastical elements both believable and credible. But this is a clear distinction to secondary world fantasy, in which entirely fantastical worlds can be created that function perfectly rationally according to entirely different rules and verisimilitudinous norms. The reader's understanding of reality can be subverted or played with by the author in order to create a desired effect. In horror, sinister, frightening, or disturbing elements may be emphasized. In urban fantasy, it tends toward the more wondrous end of the spectrum, or to put it in the vernacular, excitement, adventure, and all these things a Jedi does not crave. In essence, then, a mimetic setting provides the initial cultural geographical context for the narrative, as well as implying a number of base norms about the diegetic reality that function as a shorthand notation to explain the rules of this diegetic universe. And it leaves the author free to explore and explain only those aspects that do not conform to our base reality, that diverge from our norm. And therefore, the appearance of an initial mundane reality circumvents the need to create a base norm from scratch, as a lot of authors have to do with secondary worlds. They have to create their world from scratch in order for the story to happen. But with a mimetic reality, that base norm is already implied. It avoids the necessity of explaining how the world functions. It provides a mundane contrast to potential fantastic uh, 
effects, which heightens the impact of the intrusion and can create this sense of wonder. And lastly, it provides a continuous and reusable setting for fantastic stories. Our world keeps on spinning, so too does the diegetic reality of a series based on our world. So we then have the, the altered structure of series to consider. And series are part of an extended narrative. There is not necessarily a conclusion to the narrative or story world that results in a true resolution, but there must be a meaningful end to each episode to provide closure and to resolve the aspects of the story. Um, obviously, when a series concludes, we conclude the meta arc of a series, and that should have a definite conclusion for the series. But series, as they're being written and as they're being published, are ongoing adventures, each building on the last. So we commonly have an escalation in each subsequent installment and a desire for the new, be it new adversaries or locations or concepts or effects. As each episode ends, there's a desire to level up the characters, to give them a power up, to give them new powers and to ratchet up peril and tension and the goals for the next story. So uh, to go back to a really old example now, if you think in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, in the very first episode, a single normal vampire was a really challenging foe. But by the end of about, I think it was about season three, normal vampires were now just incidental villains that could be dispatched at ease by not only Buffy with her supernatural abilities, but by the normal base level humans around her. The heroes had grown more powerful and more adept as they grew and as they gained more experience. And therefore, in order to keep narrative tension, one of the ways to do it is to escalate the level of threat to match that, which is, you know, a concept that we see in, in role-playing games and computer games, and we see everywhere now. You beat the low-level boss, you then get to the next level boss and the next level boss, and each time it gets tougher and tougher and tougher because each time your character gets better armor, better power-ups, better weapons. So practical matters of the, the author-reader relationship, uh, we should really touch on this as well. Unlike with a, a book one or a standalone narrative, um, there's an established readership with a series. And that readership is already well-versed in the reality as the series progresses. Therefore, the author does not need to re-explain the baseline reality each time. They don't need to explain the rules of the diegesis and the narrative universe created. And therefore, the style of narrative can be much more immersive because there's already an assumption by the author that the reader is well aware of how the world functions and what is going on. It's only the new elements that ever need to be developed. So a, re, a reusable setting a, a, or reusable diegetic story world is, is a necessary part of a serial narrative. Should the world be healed and resolved, then there's only a certain number of times and ways it can be re-imperiled without sounding contrived or trite. And you, you can see a classic example of this problem in David Edding's Belgariad and then Malorian Quintet, in which the world-ending narrative of the first five books of the Belgariad is essentially repeated in the subsequent five books, almost beat for beat to the point that the characters actually comment on it. And then he wrote the Elenium, which has a lot of narrative similarities to both the Belgariad and the Malorian, and then has the Millennium uh, trilogy, uh, followed up by a sequel trilogy, the Tamulite trilogy, which does exactly the same thing. It just re repeats almost beat for beat the Elenium. So in each, case, in each case, he simply repeats the narrative pattern and structure of the first story in the sequel with very minor variations in setting and character. Um, to go back to escalation, um, the need to cover new territory, visit new locales, introduce new and more exciting characters and abilities and, and magical creatures. This is how... Um, the world can be, or the, the story can be made to feel new, even if the structure is exactly the same. So the fantastic reality that intruded into the first book can now be explored and mapped and codified and tabulated in an effort for the fan to understand 
all there is to know about this world. And the author in a series often adds new story world materials as a way to create this newness, this feeling of exploration. And not necessarily are these things planned from the very beginning. Quite often, authors, as they are writing, think of something new and they add it in. And there's almost like a retconning to try and make it fit with the world. But fundamentally, the series has transitioned from a closed narrative system to one that is open ended and that must continue to evolve and grow, adding new elements, adding ever greater threats. And the protagonist must become more active and seek out adventure rather than passively waiting for a new intrusion to disrupt the normality of the diegesis. And in fact, as series progress, they become more and more like the trajectory we see in portal quests, uh, although conducted over many installments. And the result of this is that many of these series become immersive portal quest fantasies that alternate between passive and active resolutions to, um, to intrusion in a cycle sort of, es of escalating power dynamics. And an interesting aspect of this move toward immersive fantasy is that heroes gradually accumulate um, several like magical helpers and allies, which results in the construction of a balanced party of individuals, a quest party, which of course is one of the big tropes of portal quests and quest adventures and adventure fantasy. And these, these groups then end up touring various new lands and finding more acquisitive plots rather than the defense of an established territory where suddenly there's a fetch quest or a plot coupon collecting quest. And therefore, series are fundamentally different to the sort of assumed closed narratives and the existing sort of critical and structural paradigms we use when we look at fantasy. And given the recurring use of setting, the continuing development of characters over the course of the series, and the need for new adventure after new adventure, in effect, the need for new and interesting developments and growths and settings and locations and adventures, there can be no clue closing of the narrative to allow for the traditional ending and resolution of the story as we sort of posited in those academic and critical approaches to understanding how these stories function. The, the fantastic intrusion is too passive a structure for the acceleration of growth and character and development and the exploration of the diegetic reality. And I hope, well, it, you know, it was a wee bit rambling this, but I hope that kind of explains how when we think of story structure, it's not just about pairing the stuff away to go, that's what this thing is. It's actually about trying to take narratives apart and see how they fit together which allows us then to see elements that correspond to other stories, other authors' work, and see these interrelationships. And I think this is absolutely fascinating because sometimes we, we latch on to the superficial similarities of stories to say, if you like that book by that author, you will like this book by this author. But if we understand perhaps how the story elements and story structures are working, there are other authors who use that that we may find their work just as engaging because it's fulfilling that narrative need. Well, those are just my thoughts on it, but um, thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next one.